Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today for Beginner Watercolor Wednesday, we are going to have a beginner watercolor painting with no shenanigans this week. There were a lot of shenanigans last week, but it was fun and that was okay. And sometimes you just gotta go off the rails and uh, and play. So um, I was here picking the colors that I plan on using and um, I've, I've kind of masked my watercolor paper off. So I've got a square and we're gonna paint this painting, uh, this photo that I shared on Instagram last week of a beautiful sunrise um, over the snowy trees for my backyard and I thought I would try this paper this is fluid 100 hot press finish I picked it up on sale um, about a month ago and I haven't tried it yet so um, use whatever paper you have but that's what I'm giving a try today and the colors that I have picked here I've got an Indian yellow I want to have colors that will be really representative of the sunrise but also I want them to um, I want them, you know, to blend well, to mix well, to be easy to work with. I've got this uh, cerulean blue here. These are the Renaissance paints. Of course, use whatever you want, whatever you have. Now, I definitely know I want these three for the sunrise, um, but because the blue is kind of soft, I knew I wouldn't be able to mix a really dark color for my trees. So I've got this nice dark... I don't know if this is called Polish green. It looks very much like the Yarka's Russian green. It's just kind of a really deep green, almost like a hooker's green dark. Um, and I've got a sepia, which is a very cool brown. And then I've got some Chinese white that um, I'm actually just gonna put a drop of water on right now so it'll be um, diluted when we need it later. Because on the uh, photo, the snow isn't really bright. Nothing is really bright white, so I don't wanna mask it or use wax uh, because it's just gonna be too glaring. So I wanted to make sure that I was gonna have a softer white when I come to that point. So what we're gonna start off with, and this is the brush that I kinda keep in this little set of paints. It's my little handmade uh, travel brush. I just cut down a big, um, acrylic brush and I actually sanded it a little bit so if you have like a big acrylic brush that you don't really use for acrylics I don't typically use large rounds for acrylics you might be able to kind of sand it down and um, and what I mean by that is I took a piece of sandpaper and I just kind of wiped it across the sandpaper and that kind of frayed the hairs a little bit which made it more absorbent so um, you know, wet your paper with whatever you want I think I will use a flat for that just because it's a little bit easier to wet the paper I tape this off and if it looks kind of gross that tape it's because I'm using regular masking tape and what I do is I stick it to my jeans before I um, before I paint so it picks up some lint so it won't be permanently stuck to my paper. Now with a hot press paper the paint's probably going to want to slip and slide around a little bit more than I'm used to so we'll just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, if yours isn't moving quite so much it could be just because you may be using a cold press paper. I'm going to start off with some of the cerulean blue and actually, you know what, I'm going to move my metal palette over here. I have this silicone mat that I've been experimenting with. I really like it, but um, my pans want to move around too much on there because they have the magnets on it. These without the magnets seem to be fine, but um, I don't like the glare from my plastic and ceramic palette, so I'm hoping this will be a better experience for you guys at home. So I'm going to go in and throw in some of this. Cerulean. It does have a different look when you're on a hot press paper. You're going to see a little bit more of the texture of the paint and you're going to see that granulation kind of or, or the pigment particles. It's um, It does like kind of the effect does kind of go away as it dries. So if you're hoping to get that effect like buying hot press paper, you do kind of lose it. Now I'm going to take a little bit of the magenta here. And uh, that, ooh, that's really strong, isn't it? I'm gonna get rid of a little bit of that. I can blend it in there. Now, of course, the paper's gonna dry a little bit lighter, so I want to account for that. We do have, for the, for the awful cold winters that we have in Maine, we get some gorgeous sunsets and sunrises this time of year. I don't know if it's because every because like everything just seems brighter with the snow or what it is, but we do we get some really beautiful ones. And I need some orange for where the sun actually is. So we'll grab that uh, gamboge, a little bit of the magenta. Oh, we got a little pine needle there. <laughs> a little lifelike, isn't it? Get some of that in there. This will be our brightest spot. 
Now I don't know how the hot press is going to shift as it dries, so um, I think I'm going to go in and make sure I have everything plenty bright. And I can even add a little bit of that up in here. I had a lot of requests to paint this after I posted the the um, painting on Instagram, so uh, so I hope you guys like it. I'm gonna get, make some of these little like clouds here. Now you might be worried about that blue in there. Is it gonna turn my yellow um, into a green? It really shouldn't because the blue is rather weak, even though it is kind of a green-based blue because it's a cerulean. Um, it's not strong enough to really affect it all that much, so. Don't have to worry too much about it. Plus, I am kind of keeping it div divided a little bit. Let's see, I want to go a little bit stronger in with some of that blue, though. I'm typically not a fan of hot press paper, but um, but I thought I'd give it a try, and I couldn't resist the price. I think it was like like six bucks or something for this. So I'm like, I'll give it a try. Plus I wanted to do, so I like to do like small botanicals in the summer um, when I'm on vacation, we rent a camp and I like to just, you know, I like to spend an hour painting a leaf sometimes and that just gives me, this would be a nice surface for that, I think. And maybe pump up the red a little bit. Work it into my brush really well so that I can carry it along the painting and so that it um, won't be too overpowering, won't get any big gobs, it'll be a little bit better dispersed. Now if you feel like um, it's too streaky or you're seeing too much of a pattern, too much, um, you want to break it up a little bit, you can spritz it with a little water and that will help break it up. But we're going to have so many trees in front of this, I'm not really that concerned with it. What I'm going to do now is dry this with my heat tool and um, you could also use a hair dryer or anything like that just to get it to dry and when we come back we will paint on the trees in the snow. Okay, that's dry. Now another reason I wanted to tape off the edge a little bit, not only was it to crop it like a square like my Instagram photo, but also because of these papers, this um, this brand here, Fluid, they the way they sell their paper is called an easy block. And basically what that means is it's bound on the top and the bottom edge, but the sides are open. And I have had problems with this paper, not this particular paper, but I had some of their, their um, cellulose paper, there were easy blocks and the paint would always would always like sloosh into the sheet underneath and that would really annoy me. So I knew that was the deal with this paper so I just taped off the edge. So I just wanted to let you know that in case you get the easy block. People often will ask me, when you're painting on a block, can the paint seep down to the pages underneath? And um, with any other block I've never had that happen. It's just because this is only bound on two sides and it does give you that, um, it unfortunately has that property. Um, I'm looking at my dried little swatches over here. I really think it's neat on the hot press how you end up with a harder edge. I really want to play with that a little bit more in another painting, I think. So the first thing I'm going to do here now that this is dry is put on a couple evergreen trees. And I'm going to start off with my green. I know I want to mix it though. So we got this nice dark green, but that's really too bright for the time of day that we have. So I'm going to add, I want to desaturate it, so I could add red to it, but I think because I know I'm going to have some tree trunks and I want to be brown, I'm going to use the sepia here. So these don't have magnets on the bottom, they were clipped into the, uh, the rails of my palette. There, that looks pretty good. So when you're mixing colors, just ask yourself, what does it look like the most? You know, just go, go with your intuition. Now because I know I'm going to have... Um, some snow on the branches. I don't want to, I'm going to try to paint around the snow a little bit because I know it's going to be difficult for white to stand out on top of this color and this color will tend to want to bleed into the white. I want to have one evergreen tree going right off the page for a little scale. And I'm just kind of dabbing on the leaves with my round brush. dabbing on the branches, I should say. I don't want to cover up the whole sky, so keep that in mind. You do want sky to be showing through. And because you're painting, you can put more trees, less trees, you can make them fuller, you can make them sparse. You're, you're the architect here. 
trees also happen in front of the trunk. Okay, so a lot of times, I mean branches, because a lot of times people will put branches out to the either side but have nothing in the front in front of the trees. You need to have the branches in there too. And you want them to kind of, um, since we're going to have snow on them, they want to kind of droop a little bit too on the, on the edges from the weight. And I want to do another little one. Let's have it a little bit shorter, kind of, um, let's do a little off center in case I can't fit another evergreen in there. I want to have it. I don't want anything smack dab in the middle because that kind of will steal your attention and sometimes hang a viewer up in the middle of the painting instead of letting them travel through. And really observe, you know, if you have, if you get snow where you live, um, you when it's snowing, look at the trees as they're being weighted down by the snow and see how, um, see the shapes the branches make, see how they bend. See how the snow sticks. Different snows will behave differently. And I think I will start putting in some regular branches and I'm just gonna use sepia for that. I'm gonna clean my brush off. Now if I wasn't doing a tutorial, I would have this, um, this pan right in my palette, how it normally is, but I didn't wanna get confused, grab the wrong color by mistake while I'm trying to think and paint and talk at the same time. Uh, so I just bring it out here on my mat, but I, you know, if you're painting at home, you can obviously just keep it in your, in your, um, in your palette. So I'm just going to put some branches here. I might switch to a smaller brush because the one drawback to using a brush that's more designed for acrylics is that it doesn't, uh, disperse its paint equally it sometimes can like everything can rush off your brush at once that's why i did a little bit of sanding to the bristles to kind of give it a little bit more grip with the um with the water i think i probably will switch brushes once after i get a couple of the larger trunks in here and i'm not going i'm not following my um my picture exactly because I, I don't want to cover up all the sky. I don't want it to be cluttered. I want it to be a little bit more peaceful, kind of like how peaceful you feel when you are, um, when you're looking, you're drinking your coffee in the morning. At least I am. My kids have gotten off to school. It's dark when they get on the bus this time of year. So, you know, they're, they've gone off to school and I'm sitting there drinking my coffee and I'm watching the sunrise, watching the morning news. I'm um, just having that kind of like, Zen time to myself every morning, pretty much. This is a dagger, by the way. If you, um, uh, this is such a wonderful tool. It's actually fun for doing florals too. I use it in my um, uh, my watercolor floral workshop course that I'll link up below. But it's really excellent for doing like grasses, any like long branches. The thing that I love about it is that if you twist, I'll show you over here. Um, so you can get a nice, nice, fine razor sharp line like that, right? But if you want like kind of crooked line, you can just kind of twist it and drag it and you can just get like a really gnarly branch really easily um, without thinking too much. So if you're someone who feels like you just can't help yourself, you have to line everything up perfectly um, and you can't be random if you try, a brush like this can really help you. But you can also use it with great control and get some really great, um, really great effects. I'm adding a little bit of cerulean to that sepia just to give a different color temperature to some of these. And I could have put some far away forest like in the wet, um, in the wet paint, like when I was doing the background, that would give me like kind of like soft mountains in the background or soft, uh, trees. I probably should have done that, but I, I was, um, I really was loving the bright sunset colors or sunrise colors, so I didn't want to do that at that time. I do definitely want to have some of these branches just going right off the top of the page. These trees are old and tall. This is kind of fun. I was really surprised that, that, um, the people asked for a tutorial of this. I just shared it as kind of like, oh, isn't this pretty? Uh, but this is kind of fun to paint and what a wonderful warm-up if you're just getting started for a day of painting. There's nothing like a winter sunrise. 
it's our um, it's our reward. <laughs> it's our reward for living someplace that's so cold in the winter. It's snowing right now, actually. I'm gonna fill this area in a little bit here because I feel like I need a little more visual weight. I'm just gonna pull up some more branches here. Now there is, the, the issue that we might have with this painting here is there's not really a strong focal point. I would say this tree here is probably the strongest focal point, but um, but there's not really a strong one. So um, that might be, that might be a, an issue that we have as we're going along. I feel like maybe I'll have a tall evergreen kind of like up here. I do have one in the photo. I think that would work really well. I'm going to do sepia in the green again. This guy's going to be right about here. A lot of times you have these trees and they're just very spindly. It's like they don't have much of a branch, of like a trunk, but then they'll have like a little They'll have their a few branches up top, and it's because the, the forest is dense and they can't get enough light to the bottom, I guess, so they stretch up to the sun. Might have a couple little spindly little branches down there. And I think I will try to brush up a little bit of distant um, distant trees. I'll do that with the, the cerulean, a little bit of sepia. Really, really, really pale here. I'm just going to... Add that in for a little thickness down here. I still want that beautiful sunset to show through, but I feel like I just need a little bit of a little bit of atmosphere there. Just kind of dry brushing it in, really. Okay, so now we're going to let this dry, and we're going to go in with some snow. Okay, if you have white watercolor on a tube, I would urge you to use that because it'll be a little bit easier. If not, just get a, um, a fairly, um, well, you want a semi-stiff brush. This is a, um, just a filbert here, and it is a golden tackle on bristle, and I'm just going to work the paint a little bit till I get it nice and liquid. And I'm also going to want a little bit of uh, cerulean in this, so I'm just going to put some... There, you'll see this this white this white is almost a little bit off white. And if you do um, kind of discolor the top of the pan, don't worry, it's only hap it's only on that top layer, and you'll be able to wipe that out when you're done. Uh, so now I want to start over here on this tree and really put the snow on there. I like using a filbert because I can get almost like uh, a cross between a flat and a round so I can kind of tip my brush and get different shapes. You can actually add branches in here if you don't have, if you didn't paint enough on there. And you can see that it does kind of want to pick up the uh, the paint underneath so if you find that it is you can clean your brush and uh, and get some more. But remember, you don't want your snow bright white because it's not going to look natural. There's not enough light being reflected off the snow to make it super bright. We've got the sun rising. The sun is way back here. So um, it's getting some color from the sky. It's getting some reflected blues, uh, but this very it's very, very faint. And you're certainly not getting enough reflection on there for it to appear white, bright white. There, we've got our first little tree in there, and I think that's kind of more of the focal point tree. Now, when this dries, if you want to go back in with a brighter color, with more white, you can. Um, but oftentimes, your, you know, things that do shift lighter, and your white can, sometimes it will be a much more opaque as it dries. It really, um, it really depends. Sometimes it seems like it's more opaque while it's wet, but I find usually it will dry to a little bit more of a velvety matte finish. Mix up a little bit more. You don't want a ton of water because you do want some opacity. Usually you don't want opacity with watercolors, but in this situation you do. And I believe this is a titanium white um, watercolor. This is just what came in the set of 24 Renaissance, but most, actually I find that most student grade watercolors actually use a uh, titanium instead of a 
a proper Chinese white, so you can use whatever you have. And if you don't have any white watercolor, but you have white acrylic, you can use that. Just mix it somewhere other than your watercolor palette, because if it dries, it's going to be permanent. And, you and I would also not use your watercolor brushes, I'd use an acrylic brush, just in case your, your cleaning methods are not that perfect. So what you want to do here, any of those little branches that are substantial, you want to go and add a little bit of white on them. You can add some to the sides of the trunks too. You don't have to fuss about it or worry about being too perfect. And if you find that you want a snowy branch somewhere, go ahead and put it in. You could always add a sepia branch underneath it later if you need to. We're just catching impression of this day, right? We're not. Sunsets happen quickly. We're just getting the impressions down. Okay, we're going to get this little tree down here. I'm going to clean my brush. I'm going to get some more white out of my pan here. Really really work it. So that's why it's important that you put a little drop of water on the pan, on the white watercolor before you begin, like maybe five or ten minutes before. That's really going to help um, save some wear and tear on your brushes and help that paint just leap off of there. And just when you're done, wipe off the surface with like a with a clean wet brush and it will be, be good as new. Uh, so don't worry about any contamination there. Alright, so we're going to add snow on this little tree. And this is a very impressionistic technique. You're just giving the impression of this snowy day. If you feel like something needs highlights, you can go in and just go right from the white. If you feel like it's not bright enough, it will mix in with what's underneath and it shouldn't be too jarring. Make sure you let some of that green show underneath though. And if you are going to put highlights um, with a brighter white, they would tend to be at the top of that mass of white that you've got going on. But I could see already, I think these are drying a little bit whiter than what they looked like when they were wet. As that water evaporates and you're just left with the, the paint film, I think it's a little bit stronger. But we'll go back in and do a value check uh, in a second, make sure we get all that, all those uh, branches and everything is, we'll make sure everything is good. You typically don't use white in watercolor, so you you know this is a nice way you can actually put it to use so you don't have those pans of white just collecting dust in your stash. Okay, so I can see a couple things I want to change already and what I'm going to do here. I'm actually going to use a smaller brush than that because that just holds too much water and it releases it at inopportune times. So I'm going to use the number six round. Of course, anytime you're painting, use the brush that feels good to you. Everybody's got different abilities, everybody has different preferences. I'm going to put a branch underneath that little glob of snow. And extend some of these branches out. It's almost like you're putting a shadow under the snow. And I sometimes like to flick up the little branches at the end where there's no, if there's, the snow's fallen off of them and they've gotten a little relief so they can pop back up again. And this is, I've decided this tree here is my focal point. So I definitely want it to have some substance. So I'm kind of filling in a little bit more than, than it is in the photo. Because that's why I was really surprised people wanted a tutorial of it, because I felt like the, there was no focal point really. I mean, it was, it was pretty, but I didn't feel like it was really a strong image. So sometimes we need to, we need to strengthen, strengthen it a bit as artists. So make something dominant. Dominance is an element of, uh, of style and design and art. We need to use all those tricks to make our painting strong. And this is the king of the forest here. It's towering up above the others.
This is just the green and the sepia. Again, I'm just kind of helping this little tree have a little bit more form in the distance. Our little spindly one. Now it feels like it's floating too much, so what I'm going to do, grab a lot of the green here. Whoops. And grab some cerulean. Wipe that white off the top. <laughs> Add that in there. Add a little sepia too. just kind of fill in as it works its way down the paper. Not totally, I do want it to kind of like push back, but I, I felt like it was just hovering a little too much um, without any support. And I'm just going to add a little shadow with that same sepia, dark hooker's green, and cerulean. If you had any other stray branches that felt like they needed, um, like you had like some snowy branches that didn't have anything heavy underneath, you can go in and you can, you can put some of those extra branches in, or if you just feel like you just need more branches overall, you can go ahead and do that. And I mean, this obviously it is, um, it's kind of a sunny day, it wouldn't be snowing, you wouldn't have a sunrise like this if it was snowing, but if you did want to spatter on some white, uh, it wouldn't necessarily look like snow, it would be more like you've got some white kind of, uh, kind of stuck to, like, sometimes when the sniff has been blowing in snowy, you'll get this kind of, like, pattern on the bark where the snow is stuck to the edges of the bark, and I think that might be kind of nice to have in here. An old toothbrush works really well for this, but I don't think I have one up here. My, I, I got some stuff mixed up with my downstairs materials when I was taking a class because I would always grab stuff from in here from my class box. So I'm just going to give a little speckling here. You do not have to do this. But I like it. I think it gives you a nice little pattern. And pattern is another element of design that's really important. And, um, helps it look nice. So I'm just going to give this a real quick blast with the heat tool so that I can um, remove my tape because when you remove your tape, two things, you want your paper to be really dry and also if you're using tape, if you hit it with the um, with the heat tool, it'll loosen up the adhesive on the tape and make it release a lot easier. So if you ever have issues with your tape, peeling your paper, just grab that heat gun. Just never heat masking fluid. That will not help masking fluid remove. That'll bake it onto your paper and not be good. Okay, now let's remove our tape and see our masterpiece. Now I have to say, I'm a little annoyed with this um, this block. I think the paper quality is lovely. However, this is already like peeling up, like that page is peeling up. So, um, so I don't know. I, I like the paper. I'm just not a fan of the e the whole easy block technology. I would much rather have a block, either a block bound on all four sides or a regular pad. So that's just my two cents there. Um, but luckily the paper underneath didn't get gross or anything. Uh, it stayed. It stayed attached until it didn't need to be attached anymore. But I think this is really fun and really pretty. I like the way it came out. I think this would be really lovely on a greeting card. So if you have some of those watercolor greeting cards, it would be a wonderful project for it. And I hope you enjoyed it. It's a beginner friendly tutorial. So if you know anyone getting into painting, they could use a little extra help um, or a little guidance, send them my way. Send them to this tutorial because I think it's a nice, easy way to start off. I want to thank you so much for watching today. Please give me a thumbs up. I'll have a supply list in the video description including the colors that I used so you can match it up to what you have at home. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Happy crafting!